episode 224. Welcome to Data Skeptic, a podcast about data science and fake news from an algorithmic perspective. Here's your host, Kyle Polich. Coming to you this week from downtown Los Angeles, this is Data Skeptic, the only podcast mentioned three times in Hillary's emails. Today is week two of our series on fake news. I'll be interviewing Phil Mesner, Professor of Informatics and Computer Science at Indiana University. Phil is part of the Observatory of Social Media, a joint project of Indiana University Network Science Institute and the Center for Complex Networks and Systems Research. I first became aware of some of their projects when I got interested in bots and how they contribute to the spread of fake news. Phil and his collaborators have launched a couple of interesting tools. We're going to talk about several of them, but the one I want to highlight for the moment is the Bottometer. The Bottometer at bottometer.iuni.iu.edu, also found in the show notes, checks the activity of a Twitter account and gives it a score based on how likely the account is to be a bot. I wanted to see how well this works, so I ran in my own account. At Data Skeptic, by the way, follow me, guys. I have a lot more listeners than followers. What's up with that? Anyway, I scored 0.4 out of 5, so highly unlikely to be a bot. Well, thank you. I agree. I had just gotten back from a Kyle convention, so I looked up two of my other favorite Kyles, comic writer Kyle D. Higgins and comedian Kyle Kinane, both less bot-like to me, scoring 0.2 and 0.1. Although I'm not so bad, also scoring 0.5 are Hadley Wickham and last week's guest Brad Schwartz. The only anomaly I found was when I put in some people who'd tweeted at me recently. Kelsey from West End, Vancouver, scores 4.9 out of 5 likely to be a bot. Well, gee, Kelsey said something nice about me on Twitter. I'd rather a nice thing come from a human. I looked into that, and I suspect it's because, after only four tweets and eight followers, it's a little soon to say. That's the cold start problem at its finest. Listeners, put in your own Twitter accounts at the bottom meter and let me know what you find. I'm curious to hear about any abnormalities you might encounter. Are you rated highly as a bot, yet regard yourself as not a bot? Pop into our Slack channel and tell me about it. I want to see what kind of results you guys get. That reminds me, I'm going to try a new thing. As many of you know, Data Skeptic comes out at 8 a.m. Pacific time on Fridays. For the next couple weeks, I'm going to join the Slack channel live at that time and have a little conversation with listeners who want to join in. We'll talk about that week's show, anything in the news, and if not that many people show up, maybe I'll help you with your homework. Who knows? We'll see how this goes. If people like it, I'll keep doing more of these. So join me on Slack, 8 a.m. Pacific time on Fridays, just as the show goes live. All right, before we jump into our interview, I want to do a few quick background notes. Phil uses the term astroturf, and I didn't really ask him the right question to lead into what that is. Astroturf and astroturfing is a terminology now being used to describe when people try and give the illusion of a grassroots organization. So, you know, if there's a groundswell for a local candidate, but that groundswell is actually a bunch of bots, it's a fake grassroots movement, thus astroturf. Two more, and these are great topics for future mini-episodes, but we're not going to get to them for a while, so I'll give you the quick 10,000-foot answer right now. Connected components, we talk about. It's an idea that comes from graph theory and would be used in network analysis. It's also a functionality you can get out of box using graph frames in Spark. A connected component is a subgraph where you can reach every node in the subgraph from all the other nodes. If that's not clear, your best bet here for a quick answer is a Google image search. Lastly, I wrote down power law as well. That's another one that the visual tells the whole story. If you don't know about power laws, you ought to really look forward to the one day we do get around to making a mini episode on it, because power laws come up all the time in data science. I first encountered these very deeply working in ad tech. You know, on a page you have a bunch of ads. The one people are most likely to click is the one in the top position, or rank one. That drops off in rank two, rank three, and so forth. Drops off rather quickly, and generally will fit a power law which is a function describing the relationship between two quantities, whereas one increases, the other rapidly decreases. All right, that ought to be enough to help you get started with my interview with Phil Mesner. Phil, welcome to Data Skeptic. Thank you, Kyle, for having me. To start, could you tell me a little bit about how you got interested in the topic? Yeah, we've actually been working on this for a few years, which explains why we've done quite a bit of work in this area, even before it kind of exploded in the last couple of years. 
in my lab here at Indiana University in the Center for Complex Networks and Systems Research and the Network Science Institute, we're interested in networks, all kinds of networks. And in particular, my group studies information diffusion networks. For a few years, we've been studying social media and what are the factors that affect the spread, especially the viral spread of information online, why certain memes or certain pieces of information spread very virally, others don't. So in the course of this study, back in, I would say, 2010, we started looking at data from Twitter. We got a large collection of data from Twitter, and we started noticing that Some messages spread in a more or less normal or organic way, and others seem to be supported or promoted in suspicious ways. We studied AstroTurf, the fake appearance of popular or viral content, and then we started studying bots, uh, accounts that are controlled by software to basically abuse and manipulate the platform. And so for the last few years, we've been looking at this kind of abuse and what are the factors that make platforms vulnerable to this kind of abuse. Can you tell me a little bit about what it means for information to spread organically? Obviously, I know that means it's sort of more natural, but how can you tell the difference between something that's organically spreading and something artificially spreading? Organic, as you said, it just means uh, the normal spread, which happens when people talk to each other and exchange information online. When we observe at a large scale how many, many different pieces of information spread, we could start seeing some of the signatures of a characteristic of the what we call diffusion network. So I should explain a diffusion network is a graph and network in which the nodes are people or accounts, I should say. And then edges or links between these accounts represent the spread, the diffusion of a piece of information from a node to another piece of information could be anything, by the way. It could be a picture, it could be a a URL, a link to a news article, it could be a username, could be a hashtag, and, and so on and so forth. So we study these different pieces of information or memes, and we look at how they spread, and we extract features that describe the structure of these diffusion networks, okay? This could be things like the number of connected components in a network, or how many nodes, how many edges, how dense is the network, does it look like a tree, does it look like a star, are there are different communities, that is, groups of nodes that are densely connected with each other, but disconnected from other communities, and many others. So you could imagine we can extract actually hundreds of different features that describe this structure. When we look at the diffusion of different memes, we notice that most of them have certain characteristics. These networks have certain characteristics. And then sometimes we see some anomalies. We see some strange networks. Just to give you a very simple example, imagine that we see two nodes connected with an edge. These two nodes exchange thousands or tens of thousands of messages, all with a single message, like promoting a person or promoting an article or something. So that would be an example of an anomaly. If you don't look at the network, you might just think, well, there's many people talking about about this, But then you observe that all the traffic is generated just by a very small sample of nodes, and those obviously are suspicious. They tend to be typically social bots. So that's one example. But we may find other anomalies, like a bunch of accounts that coordinated together, t- trying to target an influential account with a message, hoping that that account then retweets or reshares a piece of information and generates a, a big cascade and so on. So we look for these kinds of signatures in the structure of the network, and we build a machine learning model to try to distinguish between these kind of normal or organic patterns versus these weird or what we call astroturf, fake grassroots anomalies. And it turns out that at least back when we did this work in 2010, we could distinguish between these two different classes of viral content with very high accuracy. When you use machine learning, is that a labeled data set that you somehow know ground truth? Some of these are astroturf versus legitimate ground swellings? Yes. Depending on different tasks, sometimes we use supervised learning and sometimes we use unsupervised learning for this particular task and several others, we use, we use supervised learning. So we have lots of examples and we use them as training sets. We, we tend to use pretty off-the-shelf machine learning algorithms. Uh, very often, ensemble methods like random forests tend to work pretty well. But the idea is that, yes, you have all of these examples and then the model learns to classify a new unseen example into one of these two classes. So for detecting AstroTurf, we had a bunch of examples of messages that seem to be spreading organically, and then a bunch of examples of messages that seem to be uh, suspicious or anomalous. And then the algorithm could easily pick up and learn to discriminate between these two groups. Um, You had described some of the features, like how many connected components are in there. And I can imagine where a lot of the work of graph theorists can become very handy for you in this uh, research. 
Is there anything that you're doing contextually as well, like looking at the quality of the content, or is it purely dissemination and and network effects that you study as features? So it depends on the task. So when we were uh, initially uh, studying AstroTurf, our working hypothesis, the research question that we were exploring was whether just the structure of the network had important information, even without the need to look at things like content that you're mentioning. And so it turns out that for that particular task, just looking at the structure of the network um, provided enough information. Although this is not trivial, like I said, there are lots and lots of features that you can extract from the network so that you can pick up different kinds of anomalies. But for other tasks, we tend to use a lot of other kinds of features. For example, after we build this model to detect AstroTurf, we focused our attention on models to detect bots or accounts that are automated to some extent through software. And of course, we were kind of like the first ones who discovered this idea. Actually, we, we may have coined the term social bots, which is now very, very popular. And again, this was several years ago. And at that time, we noticed that a lot of these anomalous patterns that we were observing where things were spreading in, a, in an artificial way, it was done through certain accounts that were programmed to achieve some goal. For example, to create the appearance of somebody having many followers followers or to create the appearance of a message being very popular or to uh, or to create the appearance that a lot of people were against someone or something or to make a message go trending and so on and we saw many examples of that so we shifted our attention to trying to detect bots for that we also use a supervised learning algorithm but we realized that we needed a lot more features in, in this case of course We do have some networks, but they are the networks associated with the messages spread by a particular user or their neighbors. And so we used many features that characterize these networks, the follower network, the mentioning networks, the retweet network of a particular account. But then we added lots of other features. So you mentioned content. We use some part of speech tagging uh, algorithms to look at, for example, whether an account tends to use uh, an anomalous number of you know, adverbs or adjectives or articles or nouns and so on and so forth. We also use sentiment analysis to extract various descriptors of different kinds of uh, emotional content. We also use lots of features about the account itself. So things like how long ago it was created, whether it has a long name with lots of digits, which is often suspicious, whether it has default image and this kind of thing. And then we also use temporal features. Obviously, an account that tends to tweet very often, thousands of times a day, that's suspicious. Also, if they tweet at very regular intervals, that tends to be suspicious because human communication tends to be bursty. So we develop many features that try to look at the regularity of the temporal features as well. In the end, we had, I think, over a thousand features, over 1,200 features, and we just sort of put them all together into a model to discriminate between human or automated accounts. And we built a system which now is publicly available. It's called Botometer, which does pretty well at discriminating or detecting bots. Tell me a little bit more about Botometer and how people could try it out. It's available in multiple ways. Uh, There is a website, and the easiest way to get to it is bottometer.org. You can just submit the handle of a Twitter account, and the system will run the the model and produce a bunch of different scores based on different subsets of the features, also using all the features. Now, some of the features, like I mentioned, the content features are based on linguistic assumptions. So, for example, the part of speech tagger is based on English language. So if the tweet is in another language, then it doesn't make sense to use those features. So we try to automatically detect the language of the tweet. And then if it is English, we also use these English-based features. Otherwise, we don't. We also have a measure that is, rather than a score, produced by the classifier, it is the statistical expectation that this account is is really completely automated. To do that, we use a Bayesian framework because we have some prior about the total number of active accounts that may be bots or, or humans. And so we do that to get a better statistical estimate of the actual likelihood that an account is really controlled by software, as opposed to something that maybe it's a human, but might use some automation. You know, there is lots of software tools that allow a user to tweet at certain times or things like that. So those can raise the flag of automation, but that doesn't mean that this is a complete bot. 
uh, using the tool, you can get all these different scores and make up your own mind as to whether this is a human or not. And if you are uh, instead want to access this data programmatically, we also have some APIs. So there is a free API where you can get data from the Twitter API to submit to our API, and then you get those scores and you can do whatever you want with them. We have some heavy, really heavy users that even support other applications on top of our application. So for that, we have a pro version of the API where people have to contribute a little bit to our costs of running this infrastructure. But you can do a lot even with, with just a free API. So there are other tools like bots that detect other bots, and there is a Chrome extension that you could use, which will block content from accounts that have a bot score above a threshold that you decide. So there is now begins to be an entire ecosystem <laughs> of humans and bots trying to figure out, you know, what's mm -hmm. out there? Who are you talking to? Yeah. Could you tell me about some of the other tools? I I'm also familiar with Hoaxy and I think Ozome is one of the other products. Yes. Well, thank you for asking about all this stuff. Uh, yeah. So Awesome stands for Observatory on Social Media. It's really sort of an umbrella term for a whole set of different tools that we have. One is Botometer, another one is Hoaxy, which I'll tell you about in a minute. I mentioned earlier that we've been collecting about 10% of all public tweets from Twitter since back in 2010. And we want to make this data available to researchers in an easier way than you can by using Twitter directly, but consistently with the terms of service, of course, of the, of the Twitter API. So you can use our, we have tools where you can do some visualizations. For example, you can look at timelines uh, based on hashtags, you know, how much traffic talks about different hashtags at different times. You can look at a network, diffusion network for a hashtag or a set of hashtags uh, in a period of time so that you could see who's talking to whom, what are the communities and so on. There is another tool that generates a movie, an animation over time of the, the changing network. We have two versions of that, one for the tag co-occurrence network. So you can see what tags are used together with a certain tag that you're interested in. And another one is the actual diffusion network from person to person who's sharing a particular hashtag over time. And then there is also a geo tool where for the small subset of tweets that have geo coordinates associated, you could see where in the world are people talking about a particular topic. So these are all tools that are available uh, under Awesome with through interactive visualizations. And then we also have an API that allows you to get for a particular period of time and for a particular meme, which could be a hashtag or a username or a URL, we give you the tweet IDs from our collection that match that query. And then, of course, you have to get the data directly from Twitter if you're interested. But there are a lot of types of questions from computational social science that you can explore with these tools. And so we, we hope to make it a little bit easier for, for people. And then there is Hoxie that you asked about. So Hoxie is the result of our interest in studying the competition between misinformation or low credibility information or content online and high credibility content or debunking or fact checking. Uh, so we wanted to build an infrastructure allowing us to study this. And once we built it, we wanted to make it available to the public. And so that's how Hoxie was, was born. So it's a website. You can Google Hoxie. Uh, the actual URL is hoxie.iu.edu, but it's easy to find. There are two modes. One is you can look for an article or a URL or anything directly from Twitter. And based on the data that we can get from the public Twitter API, you can build a network of diffusion. You could see who's talking about this, who's sharing this particular meme or article. The other mode is based on a collection that we are maintaining. It's a corpus of tweets and articles from two different sets of sources. One is a set of sources of low credibility content. These are some of the websites that publish fake news or completely fabricated stuff or misleading or clickbait, conspiracy theories, junk science, and, and so on. And then we also monitor content that comes from a set of established fact-checking organizations. You can search for some content and we have, it works like, it's a search engine. We'll show you a list of articles from either low credibility or fact-checking sources that match your query. And you can select one or more of these and then visualize the diffusion network for this article or sets of articles so that you could see who's sharing this information, are the people who are sharing the misinformation also exposed to the debunking? And 
bad news, spoiler alert, the answer is usually no. <laughs> and this is one of the things that we're finding in our research is that the segregated structure of the online social network makes it such that the people who are most vulnerable to a certain kind of manipulation are not exposed to the type of debunking or fact-checking about that misinformation, unfortunately. So we integrated Botometer with Hoaxy so that each node gets colored based on its bot score. If you have a, a big influential node that is uh, being retweeted by many and sharing a particular piece of uh, misinformation, you can see, is this a human or is this a bot perhaps, or are bots contributing to amplifying misinformation. And, and we're finding in our analysis that bots do play a very important role by amplifying misinformation, especially early on in the spreading phases and uh, by targeting highly influential users. And they can be quite effective at uh, manipulating our opinions, unfortunately. Like so many of you, I'm constantly learning just for the pure pleasure of it. And that's why I love The Great Courses Plus. They have over 10,000 fascinating lectures presented by top professors and experts. You know, I'm just hitting the homepage at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash data, and right away I've got the inexplicable universe with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Another click, the science of information. Man, lots of great stuff. But you know me, I like to go deep. And like I was telling you about last time, that's how I found the robotics course. So listeners, sign up for your free trial and head over there. As you know, we've been doing this series on artificial intelligence, and I barely commented on robotics. It's, in my mind, kind of its own field, and a great complement to our content. 24 lectures on the subject, really accessible content. It gets into robotic design, different ways we'll build them. Swarm robotics is something I'm particularly interested in. This is a field that's going to revolutionize the world, most likely, in the next couple decades. And the Great Courses Plus lecture on robotics could be your first step in understanding all those concepts. Binge watch it in your office like I did, or get the Great Courses Plus app, where you can watch or listen anywhere. So I really do want you to check out that course, and I've got a special offer for you. For a limited time, Data Skeptic listeners can get one month of full, unlimited access. That's right, enjoy all their lectures totally for free. But to start your free trial, you've got to go exactly to the link I'm going to give you. It's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash data. One more time, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash data. So I imagine that if fake news was purely spread only by bots, then the diffusion analysis would make it obvious. And since it's not a solved problem, it must be that fake news is to a certain extent, getting propagated in an organic way too. Uh, as you said, maybe it gets uh, boosted in some way, but real people must be sharing fake information as well. Have you been able to learn anything about that process? Absolutely. Humans do spread misinformation, and the majority of the spreading is done, in fact, by humans. But these humans are tricked, and they retweet bots. If we look at the retweet network, for example, we find that the majority of the retweets of tweets containing links to fake news or misinformation or low credibility content, the majority is done by humans. But if you look at who are the accounts that are retweeted by these humans, you find almost as many bots as humans. So that means that bots are being very effective at amplifying the message, boosting, exactly like you said. But once it is boosted, the whole point is to get humans to look at it. Because if it was only bots, then it wouldn't really be a problem, right? Bots would talk to other bots. Who cares? The problem, of course, is that people fall for it. They can be influenced. A bot can penetrate a network of uh, like-minded people. If you have a bunch of people who think that Trump is a really terrible person, I could easily build a bot that infiltrates that network and spreads fake news against uh, Trump or Clinton. Mm -hmm. Either way is the same. I can penetrate the network of people who don't like Clinton or don't like Trump and generate fake news about them. So People tend to, of course, believe things that reinforce their beliefs. Uh, we understand this well from psychology and social psychology. We have innate biases like confirmation bias, selective attention, and so on. So bots can exploit these kinds of cognitive and social biases to make sure that people who are vulnerable are exposed to misinformation that they are likely to believe. So we do find that for fake news that go viral, after the first few seconds in which bots are really dominating the spread, after that, 
it could either die out and then, okay, this is not a viral message. But if it does spread virally, it means that humans pick it up. And once humans pick it up, it's very hard to trace it back and find those signatures of the bot activity. That's why we needed to build the hoaxy tool to go back in time and see what was happening in the early phases. Once something is spreading virally, it's very hard to recognize amplification activity that was occurring very early on. Yes, definitely humans are targeted. We are vulnerable. We all are vulnerable because we all have these kind of natural biases of tending to wanting to pay attention to things that, you know, that resonate with our beliefs or also that look very popular. It looks like many people are sharing something. So we want to look at it. And of course, bots can leverage that and exploit that as well by creating the false appearance that something is popular. If you see that a video has been looked at by, you know, 10 million people, can you resist the urge of looking at it? <laughs> it's a very natural bias that we have. And, and so people who, can, who want to manipulate the information ecosystem knows, know that and they can exploit it. And it's interesting how the view has become a measure of credibility. <laughs> yes. If you think about it, it's kind of natural. If you don't worry about abuse for a moment, then it's perfectly reasonable to assume that if many people are paying attention to something, then it must be good, right? Mm -hmm. This is like consistent with our kind of default, a little bit naive assumption that we have a marketplace of ideas and the best ideas will win. Mm -hmm. If everybody is looking at something, there must be good something good about it. And many times it's true and our bias is, uh, you know, has very good foundations. If you're a zebra and you see all of your friend zebras running, you'd better run, right? <laughs> there must be a good reason. So very deep in our brain, there is this very important bias of uh, using others as a signal. Pretty much all of our social media platforms use engagement as a very important signal. Facebook and Twitter show you many things, and you're not going to look at all of the things posted by your friends, so they rank them, right? They mm -hmm. put at the top the things that they think you are most likely to be interested in. How do you make that prediction? Well, if a lot of your friends like something, then probably you would like it too. So this mixes the uh, idea of homophily, that is, friends have similar interests, and the idea of engagement. If a lot of people like something, then you will like it too. Many times this is true, but this can also be abused. By knowing that algorithms use those factors to rank content, I can create content that is designed or engineered to trigger those metrics. Again, I can use bots to make it look like many people are sharing something, and I can create content that is targeted for a particular group of people who are likely to respond to it. Very interesting, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can give you a very uh, simple example. Um, mm -hmm. Many people have heard about the fake news that the Pope uh, endorsed Trump mm -hmm. prior to the 2016 US elections, but few people have heard that on the same day, the same fake news source that generated that particular piece of fake news also generated another piece of fake news that said that the Pope endorsed Clinton, <laughs> except that that one didn't go viral. But the two messages were crafted to appeal to the two different groups of users. It turns out that um, based on analysis done by many people, in, at least in 2016, the misinformation in the pro-Trump camp or anti-Clinton camp tended to spread much more virally than in the other camp. Not only you're tricking users, but you're also tricking the algorithms. Because when an algorithm sees that something is spreading among your friends, then they will show it to you because they'll ass the algorithm will assume that you are interested in it too. And so it's sort of a reinforcing uh, loop. The biases of the algorithms and the biases of the people reinforce each other, and you can exploit that if you're trying to spread misinformation. So I want to quote the uh, question you raised with your co-authors in your publication in Science. How common is fake news and what is its impact on individuals? There are surprisingly few scientific answers to these basic questions. Mm -hmm. Now, a short period of time has passed since you published that. I'd like to know, do you still feel the same way? Have things gotten better? And uh, if not, what's preventing them? Definitely, that's still one of, maybe not the only, but one of the few you know, million-dollar questions. We know a lot about how misinformation spreads. We begin, to, I shouldn't say we know a lot, we begin to know quite a bit, but there is still a lot that we don't know. We begin to have data from the platforms themselves about how many people were exposed to certain bits of misinformation, especially the ones that came from Russian trolls. But we don't really have a complete picture or map 
of the diffusion networks for the large amount of misinformation that is generated every day. Our platform, Hoax, is trying to sort of begin to provide a little bit of that data, but we really need the help of the platforms. Many researchers from academia, including my co-authors on that paper and others as well, have been talking to the platforms. And the platforms, of course, now really appreciate the importance of this problem, even though they may have perhaps underestimated it quite a bit in the early phases. They realize that it is important to understand this and that sometimes it's good also to collaborate with uh, academics outside of the platforms themselves. So there is right now a lot of activity between researchers, platforms, and funding agencies in finding mechanisms by which we can collaborate. One of the collaboration means giving researchers access to data so that we could really answer the question that we posed in that paper. What is the reach? What is the impact on individuals? Because even if you know that, let's say, you know, a million people has seen a piece of information. That's not the same as knowing what effect that exposure had on those individuals. We have some lab studies that explore this question, but it's really hard to put it all together. And we're very far from being able to answer these questions. That that is like, what is the impact on society? For example, some people have claimed that the viral spread of fake news prior to the 2016 U.S. elections affected the outcome of the elections. And we really don't know that. There is no way to prove that that's happened or that it's not happened. And there are some very good scientists who have published papers arguing both sides of that. Some that have argued that, yes, of course, for sure, there was an impact on the outcome of the elections. Another who says, no way, it's very unlikely. And both of these studies or sets of studies are based on assumptions. You know, you have to make assumptions. For example, what is the likelihood that your probability of voting decreases by a certain epsilon, given that you're exposed to one additional fake news about uh, your candidate? Depending on what assumptions you make and what numbers you plug into that kind of model, you might come up with totally different predictions. Now, the elections were decided by a small number of voters in a small number of states. And fake news about the candidates spread to numbers of people that were orders of magnitude larger than those small margins in the voting. It is very difficult to rule out categorically that there was an impact on the elections, just like it is very different to prove that there was an impact on the elections. These are very important questions because certainly those who are trying to do this kind of manipulation believe that it can be successful. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it, right? We need to understand the problem. We need to understand whether it actually affects democracy. Because, of course, uh, you know, one of the bases of democracy is a well-informed electorate. And so if people are misinformed that they may not vote or they may vote based on wrong information. And, and so the consequences can be very important because then the outcomes of the elections determine policies and they determine you know, the future of our planet is at stake. So right. these are really, really important questions. And that's why uh, we try to work hard and to, to, to see if we can find ways to collaborate with the platforms to uh, explore these questions. I agree. It's it's challenging to make a convincing argument that's empirical about the impact of fake news in, on the election. I mean, I suppose the, the right place to start is to simulate two Earths, one like ours and one without <laughs> fake news, and see how often the election plays out which way or the other. Yes. It sounds a little silly when I say it like that, but I don't want to rule out simulation. What can we learn from you know some Markov chain Monte Carlo type things going on in some simulated network? You're right, of course. Uh, Ideally, we would like to build a very complex and faithful and accurate and efficient simulation of the world. And of course, that's impossible because the simulation embeds uh, many assumptions and uh, you get completely different outcomes of simulations depending on different assumptions that you make. So unfortunately, we can't simulate our way out of it. We can have some empirical studies, but it's hard to reproduce exactly what happens in the world. And likewise, it's hard to build models that really capture the complexity of the world. The entities that we are studying or that we want to model are humans, and they are complex entities, and we have brains, and we have biases, and we process information in a very quick way, and we form our opinions in ways that very often are not rational. So it is uh, extremely difficult, and it is a very active area of research to build 
accurate models of information spread. And in fact, we have a grant right now in a project that specifically is trying to do that, to build the next generation of large-scale simulations that can reproduce the dynamics of information diffusion in very large systems. This is a very, very tough research challenge. I also want to go back to your idea, like what about models? So now that I've said that this is not easy, I should also say that we are very interested in modeling and we actually do a lot of modeling work in our group. For the reasons that I described, we tend to focus on models that are very simplistic. If you try to build a very complicated, sophisticated model that captures a lot of things, it's going to be more prone to be dependent on the many assumptions than, and parameters that it incorporates. But we think that a lot can be learned by very, very simple models. We call them toy models, so that they can allow us to rule in or rule out certain hypotheses. So for example, I said early that one of the things that we've been interested in studying is why do some memes spread virally and others don't? We understand from a statistical perspective, what is the signature of virality? We can look at the distribution, the probability distribution density function of popularity, of virality how likely it is that some meme is shared by a certain number of people or a certain number of times. And these statistical signatures are very clear. They are easily recognizable. Usually they are power laws so that the majority of things don't go popular, but there is a sizable chunk of things that go very, very popular. And the distribution has a very recognizable shape, a power law distribution with a certain exponent. And so we build very, very simple models that try to capture a few salient characteristics of the social network. Like, you know, people follow each other, this network has a certain structure, like, you know, a certain characteristics like clustering and hubs and things of that sort. We, we can simulate a, a particular node having a, a feed, like a social media feed, that contains the things posted by their friends. And we could also assume that people have finite attention, because this is true, even though we're bombarded with a lot of information, you don't look at everything that everything posts, you will only look at a few things. And we have some data to inform these models. We have data from some social media platforms that tell us, you know, what is the likelihood that when you scroll through your feed, you look at one versus 10 versus 100 things. We could plug those into the model. And then we could ask questions like, does this, is this model able to reproduce these statistical signatures of popularity? And the answer is yes. If you assume that the network has the structure that we know about social networks, and furthermore, that people have finite attention, like I just described, then what you get is that the distribution of popularity matches these typical power law shape, even though in the model, you're not assuming that different memes have different quality. You assume that everything is the same. Each meme is just a number. And people just share things at random from their feed. And despite that, you observe this power law distribution of popularity. So what that tells us, even such a simple model, it can tell us that you shouldn't assume that the stuff that goes popular is the best stuff because some stuff is going to go very, very popular, viral, irrespective of quality, just because of the finite attention and the structure of the social network. So you don't have to bring into, into this model the quality. Let's say, let's call that model number one. Then we ask the question in model number two, what if there is quality? What if you assume that each different meme has a different quality and that people, let's say that uh, you're my friend and you post something of high quality and then Jane is my friend and she posts something of lower quality, I am more likely to reshare what you post than what Jane posts or vice versa, okay? So we can mm -hmm. make assumptions in the model that the agents preferentially share things of higher quality compared to things of lower quality. Now we can ask the question, are the things that go most popular those with higher quality? Well, there is a correlation, of course. That's, I mean, it would be weird if there wasn't a correlation. But as people have more limited attention or as they are more overwhelmed, that is, as more information is generated in the network, like in real networks, this correlation goes down and becomes very small. So what this means is that in a social network, kind of like a real social media where we only see a small fraction of the stuff that is there, and that fraction is determined by the structure of the social networks, what our friends share, and so on, there is very little, very weak correlation between what is popular and what is good, which means that a lot of low-quality stuff, such as fake news, misinformation, junk science, and conspiracy theories, can spread virally. And so this little toy model helps us understand that 
these particular factors, that is the finite attention, the information overload, contribute to the patterns that we observe where low quality information spreads virally. And then we could use similar models to explore other hypotheses. For example, the structure of the network. We find that if the network is segregated, then low quality information is more likely to linger longer. And that makes sense, right? Because like I said before, you're not exposed to the debunking, which typically happens in the other half of the network. And now we are using these kind of models to look at bots. So depending on how clever the bots are, in terms of, for example, penetrating the network and following more people or having more people follow them. And also in terms of crafting messages that are appealing. For example, they can be novel, they can you know, leverage the biases of the people, like I said before. They can make people mad. If you're more angry, you're more likely to reshare. This is also something that is well understood. Then they can create messages that are low quality, but high fitness. And so depending on these different characteristics of bots, how many bots there are, how well connected they are, how well crafted their messages are, we can predict how effective the bots can be in basically manipulating the network, in controlling the quality of the system, in ensuring that their messages spread virally turns out that it is not difficult for a relatively small number of nodes to control the network, to Hmm. basically bring down the overall quality of the information that uh, that is being spread. To wind up, I think we have to bring it back a little bit to the platforms, because ultimately that's where these mechanisms take place. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's good to hear that they're inviting people like yourself and and reps from your lab to come in and, and meet with the platforms and hear you out. But I think many would say that's necessary, but not sufficient. So if by chance you were extremely close to someone like Mark Zuckerberg and you were able to speak to him like a brother, you know, cut all the bureaucracy aside, just have the conversation, what advice would you give him? Right now, because there is so much that we don't know, the first advice that I have actually given him is to work with us in facilitating the study of these phenomena, because you cannot really build effective countermeasures unless you really understand the phenomenon. To Facebook's credit, they are investing significant resources right now, both in supporting research and in internally in uh, developing various systems to combat misinformation. They're taking the problem seriously. But there is a lot more than needs to be done once we understand the phenomenon well. So my recommendation is to help build tools that allow scientists to study the phenomenon. You have to put yourself into the shoes of a a platform. This is not trivial. For example, the recent scandal about Cambridge Analytica, which I'm sure your listeners Mm -hmm. remember, that came out of a researcher at a very well-known university, Cambridge University, getting access to data from Facebook for research purposes. And then later, things get fuzzy about whether that person gave the data to a company in violation of the agreement with Facebook or whether the company did it themselves. Doesn't matter. From the point of view of the perspective, their efforts to share data with researchers you know, led to a huge understandable anger by all of us users about our data being shared with companies outside uh, Facebook that users were not aware of and would not have agreed to. Simply saying Facebook should share data with researchers uh, is not trivial. Um, We need to find ways to do it in such a way that uh, the privacy of the users is respected, in such a way that we can make sure that the studies are done in an ethical way. And these are hard problems that that we need to work on. Many of us are, are trying to attack these problems and we need to keep working on it. But the message to platforms is to work with academics, engage with academics, because the more voices you hear, the more likely it is that you can find creative solutions and find ways to make things better. I'm optimistic in spite of (laughs) our research pointing to very, very, painting a very bleak picture about how social media can be easily manipulated. Nevertheless, I'm optimistic that we can make things better, but it will take a long time. We'll be dealing with misinformation forever, just like we're still dealing with spam, even though it's not a huge problem Mm -hmm. for any single user, but there's still a lot of spam out there. Likewise, there will continue to be a lot of abuse out there. And um, But I think that uh, we can make things a little bit better by building better tools to detect abuse better 
and detect it earlier, detect it in a more effective way, dealing with it in an effective way without censoring content. But that will take a, a lot of effort. So my, my, my main message is to work together. Makes sense. So it's good to end on a positive note then, hearing that you're optimistic. <laughs> yes. So where can I direct people online to learn more about your lab? Oh, uh, well, uh, they can go to Awesome. Um, you can just uh, Google Awesome, O-S-O-M-E. The URL is awesome.iuni, which stands for the IU Network uh, Institute, uh, .iu for Indiana University, .edu. Uh, the Observatory on Social Media, and all of the tools that we've talked about and many of the publications that I, that I talked about are all available on, on that website. Fantastic. Well, Phil, thanks again for coming on to share all your expertise and research. Thank you, Kyle, for chatting. I, I enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to Data Skeptic, where the news may be fake, but the data doesn't lie. Support the show and find extended materials at dataskeptic.com. <laughs>